Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to another episode of Parallel C++. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about double buffering. So something that's very common inside of our applications is producer-consumer relationships. So for example, inside of some loop, we might have a call to a function that fills some buffer with data, and then uh, a call to another function after it that drains that buffer of its data or processes that data. Now this can lead to a bit of a performance or parallelism problem here, because we might not be able to overlap these two operations, right, for the same iteration of a loop, right? Um, we might not be able to uh, generate and process data at the same time. However, we might be able to extract some parallelism across iterations of this loop. And for that, we can use an optimization called double buffering. So double buffering is essentially just a form of pipelining so that we can overlap operations. And the operations that we're talking about are typically um, buffer fill and buffer drain operations. So generating data and then using or processing data. So in our baseline case, we might have, say, a single buffer. And with that single buffer, you know, one function call might fill it with some data and another function call might use or, or process that data, right? And we might not be able to fill and drain this buffer at the same time. Now with double buffering, we essentially double the amount of memory we're using here. So we double the amount of buffers that we have. That way, while one thread is say processing data for the, uh, for the current iteration of the loop, another thread can say start generating data for the next iteration of the loop so you can we're really just overlapping different operations here so we're overlapping the processing of the current iteration of the loop with the data generation for the next iteration of the loop that way when we finish processing our data right we don't have to wait around for new data we can just swap the buffers right and the same thing goes with our data generation. Our data generation doesn't need to wait for a processing thread to finish before it just starts generating new data for the next iteration of the loop. So we're gonna look at a simple example of how we can implement this double buffering today. And we're gonna start by looking at our baseline example here. So our code is pretty simple, right? We have our producer-consumer relationship between these two functions, one called generate data and another called process data. So generate data does exactly what it says. It just generates some integer data, right? So here we just create a random number generator using this Mersenne twister. Um, and then we just fill this std span here, which will end up being a, a vector underneath the hood um, with um, just these random integer values, right? From this uniform int distribution. So random integers between one and 100. Now on the other side of things, we have this process data function. So this is our consumer here. So it's going to take an, a span of integers here that we just generated, and it's just going to do some you know, dummy work and, and process these integers. So in this case, all it's really doing is a bunch of modulos, so division operations essentially, and additions as well, right? So just some dummy work. It really doesn't matter what this is, right? But both of these should take around the same time, right? I've, I've, I've profiled them and uh, roughly timed them out to be roughly equivalent. Now, down inside of our main function, things are pretty simple. We have a single buffer, right? That's going to be this vector here called data that we're going to size to two to the 20 elements. Then inside of 100 iterations of this for loop here, we're just going to call generate data, right? And, you know, fill this vector with some random numbers and then process data, right? So just use that, um, those random numbers that we generated inside of this dummy work here, with these modulos and these additions. Okay, so that's going to be our baseline here. Let's go ahead and look at our double buffering uh, implementation here. So our generate data and process data functions are exactly the same, right? The exact same generation of data, so random numbers between 1 and 100, and the exact same processing of data, right? So just these modulos and these additions here. We haven't changed these functions whatsoever. However, we have changed how we're coordinating the work between these two functions quite a bit. So instead of just having a single buffer here, we're going to have two buffers, right? Hence this double buffering. So we'll have two vectors, data one and data two, that will size uh, both to uh, two to the 20 total elements here. So to coordinate our work, right? So we're gonna spawn multiple threads here, one thread for generating data and one thread for processing data. What we're going to do is we're going to coordinate our work using these binary semaphores to send signals between these two threads. So we'll have the signal to process. So this is how we'll tell our process thread to go ahead and process, right, this next vector of data. 
and then we'll have this signal to generate here. So this will tell our generate thread to go ahead and start generating uh, the next round of data, right? And feel free to swap the vectors. So we're still going to be running 100 iterations of that loop here of generation and swap, right? So we'll set our num iterations to 100. And then we get to our two lambdas that uh, we're going to be launching inside of threads here. So for one thread, it's going to run this data generator here. So what does this data generator do? So for 100 iterations of this loop, it's going to start by generating some data inside of vector one. And then it's going to wait uh, for our process thread to tell us that it's done with its current work, right? So we're waiting on this signal to generate. Then as soon as we see that we're ready to, our processing thread is ready to accept the next vector of data, we're just going to swap our two vectors here. So this vector swap isn't copying the elements of our vector, it's really just swapping the underlying pointers here. So we're just swapping the data that we just generated inside of this vector one, we're swapping those pointers into vector two here. Okay, and then after that, so after we've completed this swap, right, we've given our process thread the new data. So what we do is we just signal to our process thread that you can begin working on the new data, right? So while we generate uh, data for the next iteration of the loop, um, our you know, process thread can start working on the current iteration of the loop. Okay, so that's what our data generator um, thread is going to be doing. But what about our data processor? So down here we have our data processor. So again, it's going to be running for 100 total iterations of this loop. And what it's going to do is it's going to start by waiting on the data generation thread. So it's going to be waiting on the signal to start processing data. So as soon as our data generation thread tells us that, you know, hey, you have new data, we're going to just begin processing that data that was swapped into vector two here. So this data two vector. Then after we finish processing the data, we simply do this signal to generate, right? So we send a signal you know, over to our generation thread saying, hey, we're done processing data. We're ready to accept um, the next vector of data here. So feel free to do that swap, right? And start, be, and start data generation for the next iteration of the loop. So that's roughly what's going on between these two threads here. So that's how we're implementing this double buffering. So while our data generator is generating data for the next iteration of the loop, our data processor is processing data for the current iteration of the loop. And it's doing that with these two different buffers here that we end up swapping right inside of our data generator thread. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. Um, the only thing left inside of our code is just this simple um, you know, spawning of our threads here. So we spawn two J threads, one for a generator and one for a processor. And then we'll just wait for them to join right inside of the destructors for this thread uh, or these two threads rather. Okay, so let's go ahead and compare the performance of these two things, right? Our baseline case where we just serially with a single buffer um, generate data and then process that data. And then with this double buffering case, right, where we spawn two threads, one of which is going to, you know, generate data for the next iteration of the loop while a process thread processes the data for the current iteration of the loop. So we can go ahead and compile this. So we'll compile first um, baseline.cpp and we'll do this with O3 optimizations and linking against, um, or rather um, setting the standard to C++20 since we're using things like student span. So we'll go ahead and compile this and then we'll compile double buffer.cpp as well. So with the same O3 optimizations and standard set to C++20, but we'll also link against libp threads since we're spawning those J threads. Okay, so those are two examples here. Let's go ahead and start by timing them, right? So we can go ahead and time our baseline to see roughly how long it takes to do all this work serially. So all hundred iterations of that um, producing consuming loop. And we see that, you know, with a couple iterations, it's somewhere on the order of 1.62 or 1.63 total seconds, right? To generate all that data and then process all that data a hundred times. Okay, so let's go ahead and see, you know, how the performance of our double buffering implementation uh, compares here. So we're overlapping operations from different iterations of the loop. So while we're filling you know, a buffer with data for the next iteration of the loop, our processing thread is using the data or draining the, a buffer for the current iteration. So we'll go ahead and time this double buffer example. 
And we see that it's a whole heck of a lot faster here, right? Not quite two X as fast for these two threads, right? So there might not, it might not be completely balanced, right? Between our processing and our data generation. So one of these threads might be waiting around for a bit. Um, and another thread might have a little bit more work, but we see a fairly big improvement in performance here. So we go from, you know, around 1.6 seconds down to around, you know, 0 0.9 seconds, right? So about 0.7 seconds um, faster here by overlapping operations from different iterations of this loop, right? By using these two buffers that we fill and train, right? Okay, so that's gonna go ahead and do it for this time with a simple example of double buffering. Um, if you go ahead and look up double buffering online, you'll see a lot of examples as it relates to things like graphics. But this is a way that we can harness some extra parallelism here by essentially making a pipeline inside of our code where we overlap operations, say, from different iterations of a loop. Now, as always, you can find this or any of my other examples at github.com slash coffee before arch. But that's going to go ahead and do it for today. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.